Slide one. I know what you are saying to yourself. Thank my lucky stars that I get to take research and statistics as a part of my social worker education. Well, maybe you're not saying that to yourself now, but I know that you will be saying yippee to yourself at the end of this course, either because you're done with it and can move on and never have to touch research again, well, except for the program evaluation course that you have in the fall semester of your concentration year. Or you will be jumping for joy because you realize how much mental growth you have made by learning statistics and research and how it will make you a better social worker. Slide two. One reason I think there is a distrust of statistics is that many people do not truly understand what it is and how it can serve them. Once we understand what research is all about and how understanding statistics fits into that, we will have answered our own questions about why we should take statistics or why we should be including it in our social work education. Finally, there's a little bit in today's lecture about things that we can do to succeed in this course. Slide three. We can see here in slide number three a quotation from our textbook that says, the science and of organizing and analyzing information to make it more easily understood. That is what we are talking about when we use the term statistics. I want you to notice that the author does not say numbers. The author says information. Information is simply data. The client's name on an intake form is data, and it comes in the form of a proper noun. The client's diagnosis is also a noun, which can be recorded primarily as a word. Sometimes we will see a client diagnosis written out as a number, for example, 305.00, which, if memory serves me correct, is an alcohol dependence diagnosis. But don't quote me on that. Even though that looks like a number, it is still not a true number. It is more like a word, shorthand for something like alcohol dependence, not otherwise specifies. You haven't gotten into psychology yet where they talk about the DMS manual, DSM manual <clears throat> we use in diagnosis, but it is full of odd phrases. Of course numbers are data as well. You ask someone on a survey, how many beers do you typically drink at one setting? Their answer will come in the form of a number. If they answer a case or a six-pack, you'll have to ask them to specify how many cans of beer is that. The answer is either 8 or 24 or 18 or 30, uh, depending on the number in a case. <clears throat> that will come in the form of a true number. A true number, unlike 305.00, you can multiply the number of beers somebody drank by seven and that will give you a rough estimate of the number of beers they drank in the last seven settings. However, you cannot multiply a diagnostic number and come up with something like double alcoholism. So in the rest of this semester we will be interacting with data information in its various forms and learn how to collect data, organize data, summarize data, sometimes reformat data, and in er interpret all that information in a systematic way to make it more easily understood, which is the purpose of statistics in your life as a professional social worker. Slide four. This slide and the next slide, we talk about statistics in two broad forms, descriptive and inferential. 
No matter what type of research project you're doing, quantitative or qualitative, you will be doing some descriptive and some inferential reasoning. When you are doing it with numbers and categories, then you're moving into statistics. When you read a journal article, one that is presenting quantitative research that is, you will often see a summary of important variables presented. For example, we often see tables that break down some quantitative variable such as a number of drinks per week being presented for the total data, often in the form of summations, percentages, and or averages. These tables will often be broken down by categorical variables such as race, ethnicity, or gender, to name just a few. Slide 5. Unlike descriptive statistics, we can, where we simply report what we gathered or found, inferential statistics is the process of making taking those findings and doing something to try to make deeper sense of them. Say for example we have two groups of people taking a model mugging course. One group gets strength and agility training in addition to the model mugging course and the other group just gets the course. We can then compare those two groups for example on a self-confidence variable to see if there's any difference between the groups. Since we would have a theory that tells us people who get strength and agility training are going to be more confident, we would be able to see if that is the case by comparing the two groups. Slide 6. Population or sample. We can almost never use an entire population when doing research. The Census Bureau attempts to tally the entire population but even they, with their multi-billion budget, recognize that they have to make some estimates. In order to properly estimate what the entire population is doing, <clears throat> estimate what the entire population is doing. You may not know it, but there is a census every year, not just every 10 years. And that is where sampling comes in. We usually work with a sampling of the population. If we were studying people with schizophrenia, there's no way we would be able to talk with the estimated 3 million people who have that disorder. So we settle on a smaller sample, oftentimes relying on naturally existing groupings of such people. For example, all persons with schizophrenia at the Fulton State Hospital. Sometimes we have a random selection of a population in mind because we want the typical person. Without having access to nat national census data, we usually have to rely on some kind of access, other access to the population. For example, we can randomly select X number of cities and then select Y number of districts in each of those cities and finally the number of households when each one, within each one of those districts, etc. And then hopefully we will have something that looks like the general population. There are many tools for doing this. Whole textbooks and academic courses cover the topic of sampling and research. In this semester, we will really just scratch the surface. Slide 7. Why is statistics important to you as a social worker? Salkine gives us a few reasons for students in general some of which apply to you as social workers. It will make you better prepared for advanced courses. Program and evaluation seminar to name but two. It will set you apart from other social workers at the master's or baccalaureate level where few programs will give you much more than an introductory or consumer level set of skills when it comes to research and evaluation. I think most of us would agree that it challenges us intellectually. It is up to you to decide if that is something you value or not. I seem to value it. In addition, it will make you a better student of the sciences. And it will also make you a better clinician in the field. 
being able to think critically about topics such as differential diagnosis, for example, the more you understand prevalence rates and how to predict something from a smaller set of something else, the, the more natural it will, will be in your mind <clears throat> that your mind develops these valuable discernment tools. Slide 8. Don't skip lessons. <laughs> Statistics is a discipline that must be learned in a sequence just like math. You can't multiply before you've mastered addition. You can't divide before you've mastered subtraction. You can't read before you've learned to understand the alphabet. Statistics is the same way. Form a study group. Some of you will elect to do your research projects within a small group. But that should not discourage you lone wolves out there from palling around with your cohort of researchers. Asking questions. Asking questions in class or during office hours is a great way to get a concept clarified. Since other students almost always are struggling with the same concept, you will be doing them a favor as well. Work through the exercises in each chapter. There are exercises at the end of almost every chapter in this book. And there, there are practice data sets available on Blackboard. Take advantage of them. It really helps us to get comfortable with both the statistics and the software. Look for real world applications. As you go through the learning this semester, think about the <clears throat> your practicum and what you are going and what is going on there. Is there a way you could answer questions using research or statistics that would advance your role as a social worker within the organization? Finally, practice. 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 Again, Work through the exercises in each chapter. This is not a novel or a storybook. It's a manual. And statistics, like any other skills, takes practice. 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 Slide 9. Chapter 1 has a subpart called Chapter 1A and another one called Chapter 1B. These subparts are meant to cover information not about statistics, but about Excel in particular. Chapter 1A covers formulas and functions which are available in any type of spreadsheet. Excel, Excel for Mac, Apple Numbers, OpenOffice, Google Sheets, or any other spreadsheet program that you will find out there. Chapter B, however, is Microsoft Office Excel for Windows only chapter. And <clears throat> that is the chapter that covers the amazing analysis tool pack, which is called the data analysis tool pack in older editions of Microsoft Excel, i.e. 2003 and earlier. Slide 10. In Chapter 1A, as the slides suggest, you will learn the difference between formulas and functions, how to create and use formulas, what functions are and why they are important, and of course how to use them. Note, formulas and functions are available on your Microsoft Office for Excel for Mac versions and on other spreadsheet programs. Slide 11. Even if you do not know what a mathematical formula is, by definition you are probably used to using them all <clears throat> in your everyday life. We learn them mostly in primary school. 1 plus 1 equals 2. It is a formula written out in common language. 1 plus 1 equals 2. is how we are used to seeing it and usually how we write it out longhand. 
Of course, we will be dealing with more complex formulas, ones that look more like what you saw when you were in algebra class. Functions, on the other hand, are part of Excel. It's not something that is necessarily mathematic. For example, to find the average of a group of numbers, one can either write a formula or use a function. It all depends on what's easiest for you. Usually you will find functions to save you time. You can do either 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 10 and then divide that by the count of the numbers. In this case there are 4 and you have 10 divided by 4 which equals 2.5. When you are dealing with just four numbers it is easy to do that. In fact a quite a number of you, you could do that in your head. However if you have 20 numbers to average or to find the mean of or perhaps you have 200 or even 2,000. In a recent analysis I had it close to 1 million cases to work with. I would not want to have to try to add all those numbers up and then divide them by almost 1 million. I would use a formula or a function. In Excel the average function will add up the values within a specified range and then count the number of entries in that range and finally divide the sum by the number and give you your average. All taking less time of course than it took to explain what it is doing. Alright, but I get ahead of myself. Slide 12. Let us take a moment to learn a bit about the geography of Excel. Excel is a two-dimensional object. It consists of cells It consists of cells organized by the coordinates of rows by columns. Columns are labeled with the alphabet. Starting with A and then moving through the alphabet to the letter Z and then repeating with AA through ZZ and then AA and AAA and beyond. Rows are named with numbers. And in Excel 2010 and 2007 editions, there is a maximum of 1,048,576 rows. The Microsoft Excel 2010 edition gives us the .xlsx file format which has the capacity of 255 worksheets per file giving the Excel 2010 edition a possible 4 trillion 375,268,532,000 120 individual cells per Excel file. Whew! I hope for your sake that none of you collect that much data. Unlike third grade math, in spreadsheets it is customary to enter the equal sign on the left hand side of the cell. Alternatively said, another way, you enter the equal sign first, then you enter the rest of the numbers and operands. Now, if you do remember from your third grade math, it does not matter where you stick the equal sign. 
you only have to remember that both sides will balance, be the same. Therefore, when we write out something on the chalkboard or on paper, we usually write two plus two equals four. However, when we are using Excel, we will write equals sign two plus two, which is still four, and will automatically appear in the cell when we press the Enter key. Slide 14. In this slide, we see the entire form, see an entire formula written out in Excel and contained within cell 1. Press the Enter key and you will get the answer, which I guess will be 3. I just did that in my head, by the way. What we see in cell 1 are some numbers and mathematic symbols. The equal sign, a left parenthesis, a plus sign, a right parenthesis, a forward slash. There are others and it is important for us to recall mathematical symbols and how to use them. But first let's get to the answer. Next slide please. Slide 15. And the answer is 3. I was correct. Slide 16. These are the various symbols called operators in this text. The plus sign does addition. The dash does subtraction. The forward slash is used for dividing. The asterisk is a multiplier and the caret sign increases a number or a formula by a power of itself. In this case we have the symbol for 4 to the second power which is 16. Alternatively, 4 times 4 or 4x4. Four four. If you had 4 to the third power, it'd be 4 times 4 times 4 equals 64. By the way, I had Excel figured that out. <laughs> the great calculator in my brain does not work the way it used to. In, in Excel, I wrote out the formula equal sign 4 carat 3 and I got the solution. Slide 17. <sighs> Transporting our minds back to algebra days. You remember grave warnings about parentheses, brackets, or braces? These symbols are used in mathematics to give us some guidance about how to proceed in the calculations. What order they should be performed in. Remember there is a hierarchy of math. This hierarchy is quite complicated and, and I'm not going to go into it here completely. But I do want to say that it is important to remember that in mathematics as well as in Excel, Whatever is inside the parentheses is calculated before whatever is outside the parentheses. And then, and only then, do you calculate using the other operators, the ones outside the parentheses or the braces or the brackets. The other operators also have an order. Division becomes before multiplication, which comes before addition and subtraction in that order. And another special note that the negative sign is treated differently in Excel than in normal mathematics. For example, when one inputs a cell into a cell, equal sign, negative 3, K, 
caret 2, Microsoft would ex Excel would return the value of 9. However, sometimes in mathematics, depending on where you put the parentheses, the um, answer would be a negative 9. So uh, it's, um, it's complicated. Most of you won't be worried about writing carrots and exponents and, and negative signs. So I should diverge from that. Slide 18. When we use Microsoft Excel to create data sets, we typically place the variable name in row number one. However, we do not have to do that. In addition, we can use Excel to input notation that we might not be able to do with other type of statistical analysis tools. For example, we put the term average in A12 cell and then we read in a typical Western way left to right the answer will be read in the cell adjacent to that text. In this example we're going to create a data set with a number of values and then use the average function to help us find the mean. Slide 19. Once we have entered our data with this small data set we will just do it by hand. In cell B2 we enter the value 3, hit the enter key, enter the value 4, hit the enter key again, enter the value 2, etc. When you've got all your values in place and you are in the cell where you want your answer to appear, there are several ways that you can go about getting your function into the cell. If you are the mousy type, use your pointer arrow and click the FX sign next to the formula window. The formula window is the long empty space just above the column letters. To the left of the FX button is a window that tells you what cell or range is currently being highlighted. Therefore, in natural language, what that says in this slide is in cell B12, use the average function to calculate the average of B2 through B11 cells. <sighs> like other mathematical operators in Excel, we start with the equal sign and then we enter the function name, which in this case is average. Following the function name, we put a left parenthesis, which tells Excel that it should calculate every between everything between the left parenthesis and the right parenthesis first. What goes between the parentheses is up to you. One could write in equal sign, average, left parentheses. B2 comma B3 comma B4 comma B5 comma B6 comma B7 comma B8 comma B9 comma B10 comma B11 comma parentheses and you would get the same answer as we would see in this example. Of course it is much easier just to simply use the colon to signify a value of ranges. However if the values we want to average are not in a line either horizontally or vertically we can still calculate averages by specifying which cells we want to find the average of. It does not matter if the cells are in a line or not. Now I can hear you hollering at your computer screens out there. What's all this B2 comma B3 comma B4 comma B5 etc nonsense 
You can't add letters. And I've never seen a comma used to add anything together. Furthermore, what is this colon symbol? Well, because we are using a built-in function in Excel, it already has made allowances for what you put in the parentheses. When it sees the word average following a equal sign, then it knows that whatever ranges of data you are putting into the parentheses can be separated either by commas if you're using individual cells or colon if you're using a range of cells that are contiguous. It'll become second hand before you know it. Slide 20. Once you've used Excel for a few analyses, I'm sure you will skip this step and simply enter the formulas in the cells. The great thing about 2010 Excel is that as you start to type in the formula name, it will give you uh, a series of suggestions. In addition, new for this version, it gives a little description of what the function does. Slide 21. Use the FX button at the top of the formula bar will bring down a series of dialog boxes. After you have selected which function you are interested in, in this case the average, a GUI, graphical user interface pronounced GUI, will pop up that allows you to select the range of cells to use for your analysis. Click OK and you get your answer. Slide 22. An easier way is to enter the range is to simply type it in. It can be quicker and easier and sometimes more accurate. I find that on laptops <clears throat> the trackpad will sometimes cause the cursor to bounce all over the place which can sometimes lead to improper entry of cell ranges. Slide 23. Okay, now this is one place the whole I am a Mac and I'm a PC argument means something. Excel for Mac does not have the analysis tool pack. Mac users of Office for Mac 2008 and later will need to use the Stats Plus, Plus plugin. In addition to what <clears throat> it is and what it does, what about where is it at? Okay. The analysis tool pack in a Microsoft is a Microsoft Excel add-in program that is available when you install Microsoft Office or Excel. To use the analysis tool pack in Excel, however, you have to first load it. Click the Microsoft Office button, then One, click the Microsoft Office button and then click Excel Options. Two, click Add-ins and then go to the Manage box and select Excel Add-ins. Three, click Go. In the Add-ins available box, select the Analysis Tool Pack checkbox and then click OK. One, tip. If the Analysis Tool Pack is not listed in the Add-ins Available box, click Browse to locate it. 2. If you get prompted for the that the Analysis Tool Pack is not currently installed on your computer, click Yes to install it. After you load the Analysis Tool Pack in the Data Analysis, the Data Analysis command is available in the Analysis group on the Data tab. Note, to include Visual Basic for Application VBA functions for the Analysis Toolpack, you load the Analysis Toolpack 
DBA add-in in the same way you load the Analysis Tool Pack. In the Add-ins available box, select Analysis Tool Pack dash VBA checkbox and click OK. For Microsoft Office 2003 version of Excel, follow the instructions found in this YouTube HTTP colon forward slash forward slash y o u t u point b e forward slash a s e q n three f b f e y. That information is available on Blackboard. Slide twenty five. The analysis tool pack is useful, but it is not a substitute for a full featured statistics program. Here are a few of the things that it can do. Slide 26. Apple users can add in for Excel. Apple users can use an add in for Excel called Stat Plus but I'm not going to provide technical assistance for it. There are some YouTube videos on my site that might help, plus you can search YouTube if you decide to go down the Stats Plus route. I would recommend getting to know Google Drive for you non-Windows users. I would success, suggest checking it out. I have a YouTube video posted about it and how to install it. Pretty straightforward. I'm looking forward to a great semester of quantitative research methods for social workers.